precious. So good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I appreciate you all taking the time um, to join us for our free parent webinar. Today is the Behavior Bootcamp, Behavioral Strategies to Use at Home. I'm so excited to have Maggie with Kyo joining us today. My name is Tiffany Feingold. I am the co-founder of Guiding Bright Minds and appreciate all of you um, being a part of our community. And one of the things as a parent of a neurodiverse child, my husband and I knew how overwhelming it is to get the services, to find professionals, to know where to go, where to begin. Um, and there's no really beginning and ending in this journey. Every stage, every phase, is different and we just continue to learn and grow. Um, so thank you all. And if you are not a member of the Guiding Bright Minds community, I'll add a link um, in the chat box to join. And as I mentioned actually before we got started, but you know, this is a journey and I'd love to get your feedback. If there's other topics, if there's other resources or tools that you're looking for that would help you please let us know on our website when you visit us there's an opportunity um, to ask questions to put in comments so would love to hear from you would love to get your feedback how can we help you what else would you like to learn about so let me introduce you to maggie maggie is a behavior analyst and the regional director for Kyo autism therapy in colorado she has previously taught in preschool and middle school special education classrooms during her graduate studies, she worked as a respite provider for families and saw firsthand the disconnect between school programming and the home environment. In 2015, she started working with children and families in their home and strives to design therapy programs that best suit the family and the child. In her current role, she supports families in accessing applied behavioral therapy and mentors clinicians who design and deliver treatment. So we're so excited to have you here with us today. Maggie, I will turn it over to you. Perfect. Thanks so much for inviting me, Tiffany. It's, you've built such a great network of professionals and, and families, and I'm really thrilled to be able to, to talk with so many families today about um, behavior and uh, this you know, the, the title Behavior Bootcamp is really intentional. We're going to give you a lot of information uh, and we really want this to be as interactive as possible. So use the chat and um, Tiffany will be monitoring it throughout. So if you have questions um, or, or thoughts as we're going through, please feel free to, to use the chat. I'll pause after kind of each, um, each topic that we're going through to open it up for questions. And then we'll have more dedicated time for questions at the end. But um, I really want this to be as interactive and valuable for you all as possible. And really quick, let me add to that a copy of the recording and a copy of the presentation will be sent out as well. Um, so definitely go ahead and um, just know that I will be sending that out. Perfect. Thanks, Tiffany. All right. I will share my screen here. All right, so as Tiffany mentioned, uh, my name is Maggie and I, I'm located in Colorado. Um, I'm a, a regional director with Kyo. I'll talk a bit about who we are and what we do to give some context, but really the, the purpose of today's presentation is you. It's all about you as a, a caregiver, a provider, um, a parent. Uh, we really want to be able to provide a lot of information that will help you with your children or with the children that you work with. And so be thinking, you know, you don't need to put this in the chat, but be thinking of some of the challenges that are ex you're experiencing with your children. And I know when Tiffany and I met to talk about what topic would be appropriate for a July training, it was, well, gosh, it's the middle of summer. Um, you know, families have either been going on a couple of weeks now at home without school, or, you know, I know in some states, summer school programs, ESY programs just ended. And so there's not as much structure as there is during the school year. And, and it, can be really challenging with any kid, but uh, especially for the, the children that I work with who, who really thrive on structure and do really well with all that support. And so um, share anything that you feel comfortable talking about with the, in, within the chat, um, or you can just kind of keep it in the back of your mind as we're going through. Um, at, at Kaya, we provide applied behavior analysis therapy. We have over 800 professionals, behavior analysts, program supervisors, um, behavior therapists, and some admin staff. And we provide ABA therapy in the home, in centers, uh, via telehealth. 
We also provide parent training or caregiver collaboration is another term I like to use to describe it and uh, behavior consultation with, with schools or even just with you as, as caregivers and providers, maybe not doing that one-on-one -on -one therapy, but being able to connect and offer strategies. Um, and then we, we provide support in the school community uh, and community as well. And we serve all across um, the country. So it's so fun to see all the locations. We have uh, providers in Florida, Georgia, Utah, uh, Texas, up and down the West Coast. Uh, we're not yet to, to Quebec or the UK, but the first office we open there, I'll probably be uprooting my life to, to join you all in some, uh, I don't know, I think the climate up there is a bit better than the heat I'm going through in Colorado right now. So uh, we're all over the country. You can find our locations. If you're ever interested in just learning more, um, they are all on our website there. So this uh, training is broken up into a couple sections. We're going to talk about pairing and bonding. And you know, not to say that you as parents and caregivers don't know how to bond with your child, but we're going to talk about the strategies that we use in ABA and how we teach our therapists to pair is the word that we use. And then we'll talk about behavior. We're going to define it and we'll look at the functions. So in ABA therapy, we look at the four functions of behavior and we'll get into those. And then finally, we'll talk about incorporating your child's goals into play. And so they might be goals through a speech therapist, an occupational therapist, ABA therapist. They could even be the goals that are on your child's IEP. Um, they're out of school for the summer, but what IEP goals do they have and how can you be incorporating them? So before we jump in, whoops, sorry. Um, let's see, Tiffany put that in the chat, perfect. I was like, I don't know if there are questions for me. Okay, well, let's just dive right in then. So the first topic, pairing and bonding. You know, this is the most essential component of successful ABA. You know, when I talk with families or I talk with providers, our first goal is to build rapport with your child. Um, we want them to be excited that we're coming over. We want them to see us as a valued person in their life. If it's a, a young child, you know, two, three, four-year-old, they should see us as this really fun play person. You know, we come and do all this imaginative play and, you know, you and I know that we're working really hard and working on therapy, but our kids, the kids should see it as play, um, kind of a super babysitter, right? They're coming over with all these fun ideas. Um, middle schoolers might not see us as a play companion, but they're still hopefully seeing us as an advocate, as a support person for them, um, as someone who cares about them. And so if you've ever had a child start ABA services, you may see that the first couple of weeks, it doesn't seem like they're really doing a lot of the therapy goals. You know, you went through an assessment and in the assessment, you talked about working on potty training or working on time management skills or um, perspective taking, all these big lofty goals that that we'll get to and we'll work on, but the first couple of weeks may just look like the therapist is coming over and exclusively playing. Like we haven't even touched the toilet. We haven't even started potty training. And it's because we know that the better relationship that we have with your child, the more successful that therapy is going to be. So we want our sessions to be fun. And we do recognize that, you know, we're maybe there for three hours in a day. I can be super excited and engaged for three hours. I can be really playful. I can be really fun for three hours. It's certainly not something I could do 24 seven. And we recognize that as parents, you are, you know, the medical provider, you're their emotional support, you're their art teacher, you're their private chef, you're their PE teacher, you're, you know, to add one more thing is certainly not what we're wanting to do here. And we want to just be able to show strategies to maybe reset, reset the relationship, especially in the summer, when structure has changed, how can you kind of step out of your normal parenting um, role and, and be, um, be really engaged in this more ABA-based or, or pairing way? So the overall goal here is that you become the source of reinforcement. So we'll talk when we go into the functions of behavior, what um, the word we use is reinforcement, what why they may be engaging that behavior, what the desired outcome is. But a good therapist is able to have themselves be that person, right? Have the child does all this work and, and they're learning all these skills and they're working for playtime with Maggie. Like that is the goal that they want to still engage with us. Um, they want to do something fun with us or with you. And, you know, we have families where the child will work with us all, all session and their ultimate goal is to work to play tic-tac-toe with dad. And dad is so, so reinforcing for them that all they want is his attention and his support. Um, and so we want to build and sustain these connections in which 
you are um, the fun favorite item. You know, if I ask, do you want to play on your iPad or go for a walk with mom? It should be a question, right? They should kind of think about it. And maybe the iPad today, because it's hot out and they've been with mom all day, but maybe it's mom and they don't care what they're doing with mom. They just want to be with her. Um, and so that is, is really what we try and get to with as therapists. Certainly we recognize that there, are, I have a 12 year old client who works to be alone. I get it. She does a bunch of hard work with us. She does all of her time management skills, goes through her chores, and then she takes a 15 minute break in her room. Or she doesn't want anyone near her. Totally appropriate for a 12 year old to not want anyone to be around them. Um, if that was a six year old, I would maybe have some questions, right? Like, why don't you want us to be a, a part of this. We're going to honor whatever they want, but our hope is that the adults in their lives can become that source of reinforcement for them. It doesn't matter what they're doing as long as they're with you. So how do you do it? You know, certainly I don't want to be telling you how to build a relationship with your children. You've been doing it for, for years. However many years they are old, you've been that source uh, of reinforcement for them for 10, 12 years for sure. Um, but kind of being more intentional and stepping out of it, especially if you're finding that you're having a hard time building that structure, or as we talk through the functions of behavior, you're having a hard time maybe um, having a good summer routine. And, and part of it could be stepping back and redoing some of this parent process, thinking about it through the lens of, okay, what are we gonna do for, for the summer and how can I make myself really um, stand out to my child? So the first thing is thinking of what are your child's favorite items or activities? Um, do they love playing blocks? Do they love driving cars? Do they love going on walks? Or um, I, my nephew and I go on bug adventures and we just look for bugs in his backyard and it is the most fun he's ever had. And I stand there in the shade and point out ants, right? But to him, it's like this really exciting activity. Um, and so thinking of what are, are the children that we support or the children that you have, uh, what their favorite things are, and then you becoming a part of that, right? And so I think it can be tempting to bring out new activities and maybe the children love them. You know, I um, grandpa brought a, a Nerf gun or um a squirt gun that my nephew hated. <laughs> it was not fun. And so grandpa was not that reinforcing person that day. He was not a fun person to play with because he got him wet and it was just, it went poorly. Um, had my dad like continue to try and engage with that, it probably wouldn't have ended well, but he was able to recognize like, yeah, Camden's not into this. Um, let's stop. Let's pivot. Let's go kick the soccer ball for a while. And so being able to make those changes. So what does your child love um, and how can you play with them? And also kind of refraining from placing demands, which can be so hard, especially in the summer. It's all day long. You need your children to be doing their activity box or eating lunch or doing their reading homework, um, but slowly introducing some simple tasks. And, you know, maybe you build this into a certain hour of the day. I worked with parents that are like, Maggie, I can't not ask them to do anything all day long. <laughs> like that's impossible. Um, so we have Camden's fun hour and it's on the calendar. They put it up. It's a very intentional time when um, mom is able to take a break or maybe it's right after work and it's as much as we can, it's labeled and it's said and it's, you know, in the special room, they put music on and we're building this environment where the rules are a little bit different and you're just playing with mom. And if you put all your toys everywhere, mom's not gonna ask you to clean them up throughout, right? It gives a little, takes a little from, from caregivers to get there, but um, slowly introducing some simple demands. And then we can lead to, what we'll talk about at the end, incorporating their therapy goals, right? It's not just, it is just play all the time, but it's not misdirected or undirected play. We, we wanna be playing with intention and, and making sure that we're also, if we're working on language, we're still using our language goals throughout that. And so we'll talk about how to tie it in, but we never stop pairing. When I'm working with clients, it's, it's always what we come back to. If a kid's had a hard day or maybe a hard hour, we go back to pairing. We're super silly. We're super engaged. We reduce the demands. Maybe mom says, hey, gosh, she was kind of sick all weekend. He's feeling really tired. Didn't sleep last night. Uh, session might be harder today. That's our cue to go back to the basics, to go back to pairing. Um, yeah, so some of the, the notes here, I have like a lot of praise, really labeling what the children are doing that we love. Like, I love how you knocked over the block of toys. Um, I love how high you got the tower, being really excited and engaged. Again, not for your entire day, but for a, a special part of it. Um, and 
once you notice that success, once they're really excited for that time, you know, my nephew's like, he loves Camden hour. <laughs> and he doesn't really have an idea of he's four. He doesn't have a concept of what an hour is, but he loves that that's what it is. And he asks for it all day. And, and now my sister's able to say, oh, Camden hours when mommy's on working. Um, and that's something that he can look forward to. So he now knows that it's this really exciting and, a spe and special time. Um, so you know, in some, this is one of the most essential components of a successful ABA program, a successful learning program. Uh, we build rapport with your children. You'll notice that hopefully when they go back to school in the fall, day one is not, here's 30 minutes of math homework. Day one is let's get to know each other and build a relationship. So before we get into to the behavior, kind of the real meat of this, any questions about pairing or, or things that you are, are wondering how it might work for your family? I'll keep rolling through, but throw them in if you have them. All right. So what is behavior? Um, so I'm coming to you now as I'm putting on my behavior analyst hat. Um, you know, in the ABA world as a behavior analyst, behavior is everything that we do. Anything that a person does can be considered behavior. So golfing, drinking coffee, riding a bike, walking to work, playing catch. These are all things that we do. So, you know, often we might think of um behavior as being challenging or disruptive. That might be how we're talking about it. And so it's always a, a word I like to, to really redefine, especially when I'm working with therapists who will say, well, you didn't engage in any behaviors all day. Like, That's not true. <laughs> he was there. He was in session. Maybe they were all really positive and fun. Maybe he didn't have any challenging things that came up, but he was engaging in behavior all day, every day. Uh, but disruptive behavior, I think, is the, the main area parents struggle with or all of us struggle with. You know, I don't get questions uh, from the families I work with when things are going well, right? People aren't saying, hey, Maggie, can you tell me how to continue playing with my kid? It's, hey, can you help me when he's screaming or when he just doesn't listen to me or when he hits his sister, right? It's more of those just things that are disruptive to our normal life. Um, or hinder independence is another way to think of it. Yeah, he's a super great kid, but it's really hard for us to go out in the community because she always runs away from me. And so that's what's really disruptive and, and not letting her be as independent as possible. So the only way that we can really deal with this and, and support these um, behaviors is defining it and making sure that we're all on the same page. So we're gonna define the behavior and then we can help us learn the why. So when you're thinking of it, especially if you're, you know, a part of a, a partnership, you and your, your partner are both, you know, parenting your child, making sure that you have the same definition of screaming or the same definition of an aggression or a challenge or whatever it might be, um, of non-compliant, right? All these things. And we're using really observable um, and, and objective terms. And so we want to discuss exactly what we're seeing. And that helps me when I come in and I know we're all talking about tantrums in the same way. And so when I say, hey, did she have any, you know, how was the weekend? And you say, well, you know, she had a, a tantrum at Target. I can picture what that looks like. I don't have to go in and ask more questions and find out what that means. Um, we, we've defined it. And that really helps teams kind of get to, um, get to know where to go from there and, and then how to measure success. Um, so just a, a quick practice. Um, kind of thinking of these things, you know, is, is kicking a soccer ball a behavior? So can we observe these activities, these behaviors? So yeah, kicking a soccer ball, a behavior. Maybe your child's on a soccer team and they have a goal to kick the soccer ball throughout the game. I remember when my, my sister was a soccer player back in the day, she would uh, run backwards from the ball as it came up to her. And so the goal that was set was that Grace would kick the ball um, just one time, foot, would touch it. Um, so certainly a behavior. Not listening, I'd have more questions, right? Like, what does that mean? What does that look like? I can't tell if someone's not listening or not. Maybe they, they heard me, but they didn't respond. Um, so maybe it's more that they're not following directions. Um, not listening is a harder thing to define, and I would want to drill down a bit more. Um, finishing math problems. Certainly behavior, and that's objective. They need to do 10. Um, that's what we're hoping for. Being a good student. Again, I define that differently. Like, as Tiffany mentioned, I've worked in preschool special ed classrooms, middle school special ed classrooms. My definition of a good student might be very different from a, my gen ed teacher friends, right, who 
to me, a good student is someone who is safe in the classroom with their body, who keeps their voice at a, a inside level, who um, transitions <laughs> between activities without much disruption. But if I was a high school math teacher, a good student's probably someone who doesn't have their phone out, um, who is answering questions. Um, so that again has, has so many different definitions. Um, petting a dog for sure a behavior and a, a challenging one for some some of our friends. It's hard to learn how to pet your dog. Um, so if, it, if you can teach it, it's, it's a behavior. Um, scratching an itch is a behavior. Not getting up when asked to. Again, I would have some questions. Um, but so thinking, like uh, I see something in the chat. My child interrupts me. Interrupting, certainly a behavior. Like I know what that looks like, right? I, I know it when I see it, that you're talking with someone, you're at the doctor's office, you mentioned, and your child's interrupting you. That's certainly a behavior and, and yeah, sounds super disruptive. We'll talk about some, maybe the why and some strategies there. So it's important for us to think of how behavior is learned. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do in, in ABA and in the world of behavior therapy is figuring out how you learned it. Um, what we do is based on the consequences of our, of our behavior. And so, um, putting on a seatbelt. Like I know that wearing a seatbelt keeps me safe in a car. I've read it. I was taught it. But to be totally honest, the reason I put a seatbelt on when I drive two blocks to Starbucks mm, probably is because of the beeping noise that my <laughs> car makes. Like I need that noise to stop. Um, and so I put my seatbelt on. Like I'm waiting in the drive through at Starbucks and I still have my seatbelt on even though I'm not moving because the noise is the consequence. I want to avoid hearing that noise. Now I want to stay safe, but in the interim, like I really want to just avoid hearing the beeping noise that I don't have my, my seatbelt on. Um, you know, maybe we can think of asking, asking for snacks, asking for our favorite items, right? The consequence of asking for a snack typically is that you get a snack. You go up to dad and say that you're hungry. Um, dad probably says, hi, hungry, I'm dad. But then you get a snack um, and you're getting something to eat, which is great. So the consequence of the behavior of asking for a snack is the snack. Um, so a lot of consequences are really desired. Um, consequence is a word that outside of the field of ABA often means negative. Um, the, the consequence of speeding is that you get a ticket, but sometimes the consequence of speeding is that you get somewhere faster. Um, and so we're really intentional about using this, just the product of what happens next. Um, so if a consequence getting a little technical increases what we call the future probability of the behavior, then that's reinforcement. And so if asking for a snack gets me a snack, and so I, and I like the concept, I like getting a snack, then I'm more likely to ask for a snack in the future. Now, if the consequence decreases, if I see this happening less, if I ask for a snack and I don't get it, or I ask for a snack and I'm told to go clean up the bathroom, um, I ask for a snack and dad asked me to take the dog for a walk, like maybe I stop asking for a snack. That's considered punishment that I'm punishing down that behavior, that behavior is happening less. Um, not that it's necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, so if we have a kid who's trying to make friends, um, right? And, and Mike goes up to someone and says, hey, I like your bike. And the other kid says, thanks, do you wanna ride it? And they take turn riding the bikes. Um, that's reinforcement, like that other kid's behavior of saying, yeah, thanks, do you wanna ride it? Reinforces Mike then asking other kids in the future, making those social bids. Um, but maybe Mike approaches kids on the playground and starts talking about trains or noticing all the clouds. Um, you know, that's a Mobius and that's a, I don't know, clouds. Maybe they start labeling all the clouds, right? Some of our, our kids have a lot of knowledge, um, special knowledge, and they go up to kids on the playground and start talking about that. And those other kids laugh, get bored, walk away. Over time, that's going to punish that behavior of initiating social contact. And Mike's not going to go up to kids. They don't want to get laughed at. He doesn't want them to walk away. Um, and so that same behavior of going up and talking to someone can go totally differently and then can really impact um, the future likelihood of them engaging in that behavior. So as an example, let's say my, my wife and I got a new kitten. This adorable little kitten doesn't know the difference between our sofa and the scratching post. So my wife decides that every time the kitchen scratches the sofa, she's going to put him outside to teach him a lesson. Now, this kitten learns pretty quickly that if he wants to go outside, all he has to do is scratch the sofa. Um, certainly not what we wanted, right? We thought like, you yeah, know, put him outside, teach him a lesson, then he won't scratch the sofa anymore. But to the cat, it was the way to get access to outdoors. And so you can see here, like even the unintended behavior was learned. Um, 
going outside was desired, it increases the likelihood that he's going to scratch the sofa again. Um, okay, so as a quick review, behavior is learned through consequences. So um, what happens after that behavior occurs? It can either be punishing, it can stop the behavior from happening in the future, or it can be reinforcing. It can encourage or um, elicit that behavior down the line. Reinforcement increases that these behaviors are going to happen in the future. Um, so as a, a last example here, let's say Sage um, says hi to her parents, says hi, and her parents start clapping, go over the moon excited. They're, you know, maybe this is the first time she ever said hi, and they are praising her, clapping her, cheering her. Now Sage doesn't say hi anymore. <laughs> she did not like that consequence. Um, that would be punishment. Her parents' overexcitement um, did not increase the behavior, and she stopped saying hi. Um, so just kind of thinking of like, well, is my child doing this this more down the line? I see we have a, a question, Tiffany. Can I, am I able to click it? Yeah, that's one we can wait till. Oh, the okay, yeah. perfect. Um, all right. So, any other questions about um, about behavior before we talk about the functions of them? I think the, the key things to just kind of keep in mind is that behavior is learned. So even what well, sounds really um, disruptive, your child interrupting you when you're talking at the doctor's office was learned. Like they learned that somewhere there was some consequence that made it worth doing. And we'll talk about maybe why. Um, so definitely keep that example in mind. So the functions of behavior, this is the why. Um, in ABA, this is, you know, our what I see as our call to action is to help families figure out the why. Uh, why are your children doing the things that they're doing? The positive things, the independent things, and maybe the more challenging things. And every behavior serves a function. Um, part of the goals that we set as clinicians um, help us, uh, you know, we figure out the why. And then, you know, let's say interrupting is, is the behavior we're looking at. And we're going to try and figure out the why our ch the child is interrupting. And teach them other ways to get what they want, um, get serve that function without that interrupting behavior. Um, and so our goal is to, to set up what we would call replacement goals. Here's the other skill. Here's the other thing that you can do. So we determine the function behavior a few ways, but in you know simple uh, terms, um, we look at what we call the ABCs. So the antecedent, what happened right before the behavior, the behavior, again, what does it look like? And then the consequence, what happened right after? And we, we look for these patterns and sometimes we, you know, I can come in or see this behavior over time and really get a clear, clearer picture. Other times we'll manipulate the environment a bit and, and try and get your child to engage in some of these behaviors. So if you've ever had uh, ABA therapy in the past, you know, I, I'll typically do an assessment and mom will say, oh yeah, you know, she, she pulls her sister's hair all the time. Um, and I have a 10 hour assessment and I never see hair pulling. And so I certainly don't want to go up and have her pull her sister's hair, but I might ask for the sisters to play together. And, you know, I'm thinking my own sisters see like, at what point does Grace start to reach her hand? Like what's going on? I don't, I don't want her to pull Lily's hair, but like at what point is her hand getting closer to Lily's head? Um, and then I can maybe learn why it's happening. Um, so as an example, you know, let's say, um, let's talk about my sisters and, and their hair pulling. So uh, they're now both well-adjusted, successful adults. But in the past, uh, when they were younger, they were 15 months apart and they both had this curly wild hair um, that, you know, does look fun to pull. Um, but often it would be, they were playing with toys and they were playing with kind of this, an array of toys. And Lily had something that Grace wanted. And she learned that a really easy way to get what she wanted, to get that toy from Lily, was to pull her hair. And then Lily would scream, drop the toy, and run away. <laughs> so instead of maybe asking for a turn or asking for help or finding another toy that was similar, she pulled her hair. And so the antecedent, they're playing, but Lily has something that Grace wants. The behavior is Grace pulls Lily's hair, wraps her hand around Lily's hair and pulls. The consequence is Lily drops the toy and runs away. The toy's available and Grace gets it. And so we, if we saw that pattern over time, we could maybe see, wow, Grace is doing this to gain access to items. Um, and then we, we could go from there and really develop a nice plan there. So 
The four functions that we look at are attention, um, attention from others, uh, attention from parents, caregivers, friends, peers, strangers. It doesn't even have to be positive attention. It can be just any attention, right? If um, your kid gets yelled at in the grocery store, maybe all they just wanted was for you to look at them and pay attention to them and they don't care that they just got yelled at. Um, access, so to tangibles, so that was grace, right? She wanted the toy. Um, access to a person or an activity. Uh, that can be, you know, especially when, as we talked about with pairing, when you are the source of reinforcement for your child, they might do a lot to get access to you. Um, escaping, so, or avoiding, maybe they're getting away from someone or something or an unpleasant work demand. We see this often, you know, if we're working on homework or we're supporting in the school, some of, some behaviors arise that your child's doing to try and, um, not do their work um, or escape that task. Or maybe you see it when you say, all right, it's time for bath time or bedtime is a great one. And suddenly your child needs a drink of water and a bedtime story and to be rubbed on the back. And oh, actually, I forgot that I have to put this in my backpack for tomorrow, right? Suddenly all these things come, they're delaying going to bed. Um, or sensory, you know, it, it might feel good. Um, the behavior they're engaging in might just feel good for them. Um, any of these consequences can be reinforcing. So we try and um, think about it. And it can also be a combination, which is the really tricky part. So that example of the child going to bed, you know, maybe they they want your attention and they don't want to go to bed. It, it could be two, right? I often have kids who don't want to do their math homework and they want to be on the iPad. So they want access to a tangible and they want to escape doing their homework. We can combine them. And we'll talk about strategies to combine the functions, but it's often not just one of the four. It's two of the four. Hey, it feels good to, um, let's say, you know, to, to scratch an itch, but I also kind of like when my dad then comes over and takes care of me and, and gives me the band-aid and gives me the ointment. And so that could serve a sensory and an attention function. Uh, but we'll go through them each one, one-on-one. -on -one. So kind of think of your own kids and the kids that you work with. So um, for the first uh, function of attention, um, the reinforcement that follows the behavior is some sort of attention. So Jeff screams when he sees his teacher and the teacher says, Jeff, don't do that. In the future, Jeff screams whenever he sees his teacher. He just wants her attention. Um, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be good attention. It could be positive or negative, you know, directive or collaborative. Um, Jeff thinks his that in this example, the teacher thinks that she's decreasing the behavior, right? She's telling him not to do it, um, but it's not working, right? He's screaming even more. Uh, so she's actually reinforcing this behavior, which is challenging. It's, it's the opposite kind of of what we would want to do. So the common things that come before are new people or activities that are present in the environment, or even that desired person's not available. Um, so maybe the child interrupting the doctor's office recognizes mom's not available to talk right now. And now I want her attention. Um, right. So you're not available. I'm sure working from home, <laughs> we saw a lot of attention seeking, we would call them attention seeking behaviors because you were physically present, but your attention was diverted and, and you could not, you know, be everything all the time for your child. And so, um, we either see you know, new people, new activities present or, um, the, the desired person or the preferred person's unavailable. Um, a lot of the consequences to attention-seeking behavior is attention. Um, your child screams or they pull their sister's hair or they knock over something in the living room and they are told to stop or to sit down or uh, pick that up, right? They, they get some sort of attention or maybe they're ignored. You're working, you can't give them any attention right now and so you don't, um, which is great, but you're also, We'll talk about like not teaching another way to do it. Um, and so sometimes those behaviors escalate. Um, you know, other consequences, if we think of a really great example, like that Mike with the kids on the playground, there are new kids there. He goes up and, and says, hey, can I play basketball? And they say, sure, right? So he gets access to these friends. So sometimes it's really great to uh, reinforce attention seeking behavior because that's a desired thing. Um, the next function is access and so, or, or tangibles, um, activities. So 
In this one, Jamie sees the ice cream truck and asks her dad for ice cream. Dad says no. And Jamie begins to throw a tantrum. I don't know if ice cream trucks still drive around anymore, but um, dad immediately buys the ice cream <laughs> so that she calms down. In the future, whenever Jamie hears that ice cream noise, she's going to start tantruming. She wants ice cream and she knows that it's, she asked nicely the first time, but it wasn't given. So if she just causes a scene, um, I see it with my nephew all the time. If he asks for something at the store and we say no, he asks again and again and again and again, right? And just keeps escalating until we give in because it's just too much to, to not. Um, so if reinforcement is provided following that behavior in the form of a desired item, food, toys, TV, then they're going to exhibit that behavior to gain access to those in the future. So um, great, Cynthia. Thank you. I need ice cream trucks to come around my neighborhood. I don't see them. Um, again, maybe it's really functional. Your child is hungry and they ask you for a snack and you give them a snack. And down the road, next time they're hungry, they're going to ask you for a snack and you'll give it to them. Um, so again, hunger is a big, big one that we see or a preferred item is present. Maybe they've been told no, that they can't have an item. It's the iPad's charging or it's not time for the iPad. Um, and so common consequences is either the item is given to them or again, they're ignored. Um, we'll talk like the blend of it is, is what we, we really wanna see. Uh, the next one, escape or avoidance. Uh, so they wanna escape, they want something removed. So in this example, Kevin's dad puts a plate of peas in front of him. Kevin hates peas. Um, so he starts throwing them at his sister. They're nice and easy to throw. Devin's, Kevin's dad gets really frustrated and takes the plate away. Now in the future, whenever Kevin doesn't want to eat something, he can just throw it at his sister. He learns that pretty quickly. Um, he's escaping this. And in fact, dad's actually just taking it away, which is excellent. That's exactly what he wanted. Uh, so some common antecedents here, a demand is placed, the child's given instructions, they're presented with um, an activity or materials or maybe a transition time. Hey, it's time to shake a shower. Um, hey, you need to do your math, clean up the dog toys. Um, the consequences for, you know, especially if they engage in some sort of challenging or disruptive behavior, that the activity is removed um, or they get out of whatever they were asked to do. The child is ignored. Those are some of the common ones there. And then the last one, um, again, that sensory. So Mark's playing by himself in the backyard. He spins on the swing until he gets dizzy and falls down. He really likes that feeling. Um, so in the future, if he wants to feel dizzy, he spins on the swing. Um, so sensory uh, seeking behaviors often produce some sort of pleasant or desired feeling. Um, it can be, we say, self-reinforcing, self-stimulating. And maybe in this example, awesome, Mark, you love feeling dizzy. What a great way to do it. Um, maybe if I were a, a parent, I would be able to, um, I might put like a crash pad down <laughs> so that you're not falling on the, on the ground and hurting yourself, but cool. Go ahead and spin all you want. Um, so often we see these behaviors <laughs> and this is really contradictory, but either when your child's alone or across all settings. So Mark is spinning when he's outside alone and he's spinning in the living room when we're all watching TV and at the store and in class, right? It's happening kind of across environments or um, across different examples. Um, and often the consequence, like we don't really see a consequence. Yeah, maybe we saw him fall, but we don't see the dizziness. That's an internal um, feeling there. Okay, so that was a lot of info on the functions of behavior. I see some really good questions that I think will tie nicely um, in when we talk about responding to them. So again, it could be all four, it could be two of four, it could be one of four of those functions, but we are able to bucket them into one of those four. And so when we're responding to the behaviors, we wanna really make sure that we're not, what we say, reinforcing that challenging behavior. So Consistency is really key. You know, maybe if we go on the example of Kevin eating peas or he's given peas, he doesn't want to eat, he throws them at his sister and then he doesn't have to eat them anymore. Um, we want to make sure we're not reinforcing that, right? If, if for whatever dietary reason, Kevin needs to eat peas or, you know, the rule in your family is that you try all the food on your plate and you know, whatever it is, then we're going to hold through with that. But maybe what we do is we say, um, Hey, let's, you know, sister finishes her dinner and then I present Kevin peace. There's no one to throw the peas at. Um, or I give you just one or, you know, maybe we try something different, right? But um, we don't want to just take him away because that's all that he wants. And you see that pattern over time. Um, so if the function of behavior is to gain attention, we want to ignore that behavior, be patient, but also 
prompting that attention in another way. So if your child has vocal language, if they're able to ask for your attention, if they're able to ask to play, um, then when the behavior even lessens a little bit, or, um, you know, maybe they're, and you're in the doctor's office and your child keeps interrupting you and you're ignoring it, you're talking to the doctor, you, know, you can see that your kid's okay, but then the questions kind of slow down or stop. You might at that point go, hey, if you want to talk to me, you can tap my shoulder, right? Giving that option, tap my shoulder or saying you're not available. Or maybe, you know, gosh, every time I go to the doctor's office, this is what happens. So we're going to talk about that beforehand. And I'm going to set my kid up for success and say, you know, I know it's going to be really hard for you when mommy's talking to the doctor. Um, so if you have any questions, or you want to say anything before, you can ask them before, um, or we'll pause, right? And really giving natural times to have your child appropriately ask for your attention and be able to give it to them. I mean, that's the hard thing when you're in a conference call and your kid keeps coming in, you can't necessarily give them attention right away. So maybe you give them a lot before, um, but you wait until the behavior stops, until that interrupting stops to prompt them to ask. And maybe they don't have um, vocal language, but you can do tapping and that can mean attention or mom, look at me. Um, and, and you can kind of prompt that in that moment. Um, if it's access, again, we want to, we don't want to provide them access to it. Like if they're wanting the iPad and all their, or it's the candy at the store and they're escalating, escalating, escalating to get that candy at the store, we don't want to give it to them. That's not um, the, the purpose of it. That would be reinforcing that, that challenging behavior. But again, we can wait for the behavior to go down and, and prompt them to ask for it nicely or ask for it just using words. It doesn't even have to be nicely. Um, or we can know we're going into this environment where you're going to want to ask for a lot of things. So I often will coach parents, if you usually buy the candy at the store that they want, a way to kind of take back um, your control in that situation is to say, all right, Lily, we're going to the store. You get to pick out one piece of candy that you want, and we can have it when we get home after dinner. And so she now knows, okay, I can get it, right? It doesn't have to be a fight. And um, you've kind of regained control of that moment if you know you usually do it anyway. And then you're not reinforcing that, that behavior. Um, escaping, you know, if they want to like, stop doing a, an activity or not even start, again, you want to ignore that behavior, not the person though, but redirect them to finish the task. And so if it's, um, you know, hey, Minecraft's done, like you need to go take a shower. Yeah, keep playing Minecraft, keep playing Minecraft. Maybe you know how to turn off Minecraft. You can, I have families that have a certain Wi-Fi that their kid gets access to and no one else, they can turn it off. Okay, it's not available. You can whine and complain all you want, but like, you can get it back after you've taken a shower. So maybe I then need to give you the information on, on when you can escape taking a bath. Um, often we'll have kids ask for more time. Hey, it's about to be bath time, but if you want five more minutes with Minecraft, can you just let me know? And your kid asks for five more minutes. Great. Cool. You can have it, right? You're giving them what they want, but in an appropriate way, in a way that's not driving you nuts. Um, and then you know, we don't usually do full physical prompting much, especially with our older, older children, but maybe it is like, Hey, I put the towel out for you. Hey, the water's running. Um, you're making it as easy as possible to engage in that behavior at that time. Um, or you're offering help. You know, if you need help with your, with taking a shower or, you know, you know, that they hate washing your hair. And uh, so maybe you can say, Hey, by the way, today's not a hair washing day, right? You're giving them all the support they need to, to have this be as less as uh, least aversive as possible. And then when they're done, maybe get Minecraft back, right? Maybe that's part of the structure in your family. And then sensory, you know, <sighs> sensory behaviors, I, I really have a hard time telling anyone to stop engaging. And I do things all the time just because they feel good. You know, I have a bug bite right now that I scratch because it feels good. Um, but if it was interfering with my independence, if it was interfering, you know, if I was constantly scratching during this whole meeting, I would have put cream on and put a Band-Aid on and redirected that. I would know that like now's not, not the time. Or if you know your sweet kid is loves spinning and getting dizzy, but you're like, gosh, we are in a place that's unsafe for that to happen. We're walking through the airport. And if you keep falling down the whole time, like you're going to get stepped on, having some redirections there and then providing them maybe an equivalent sensory experience. So you can say like, when we get to the gate, you can spin, like you can give them a time to do it. Um, maybe you find that they love spinning, but they also love just seeing things swirl around in front of their eyes. Um, so maybe they have a toy, those like um, little light up spinny things that you used to get at you know, Disney on ice. Like maybe they can hold that and it spins for them the whole time and they love it. And that gives them that input too. Um, so certainly, you know, none of these behaviors are worth never happening, but, but finding that time to do it.
Okay, a lot of great questions here. So I am going to, um, if you don't mind, we do have that incorporating skills at the end, which is just a few slides, but what, um, I'll go through them and then we can tie it all together. Does that work? Okay. Yeah. Wait Perfect. Wait. Um, okay, so all those functions, but then you have incorporating your child skills, right? Kind of back to why we're here. We're your home. <laughs> There's a lot going on. You're playing with your kid. Maybe you've worked through some of these behaviors. You've identified the why, but um, really taking those opportunities that they're engaging with you to be incorporating their treatment goals. You know, at, at Kayo, the, the most successful treatment plans are the ones that don't stop when we leave. The ones that parents, caregivers, speech therapists, camp counselors are also working on. And so how can you do it, right? Know their goals. What is my child working on? Um, in, you know, if, if you're a family at Kayo, you have a report, you have access to it. You're also, you know, hopefully getting very explicit training, but what are the skills? Um, are we working on decreasing behaviors? Are we working on kind of replacing them with more, more functional ones and more independent behaviors? Or, you know, maybe this, this little kid is learning to eat with a spoon. And so part of supporting them is giving them a lot of foods this summer with spoons. Um, you want ice cream? Cool. We got to eat it with a spoon, right? And I'm working on that oral motor movement um, throughout the day and, and not just avoiding it because it's like, oh gosh, it's so hard for her to, to do. Like, well, we're working on it. It doesn't have to be everything, right? Um, we want to make sure that you're having fun. You know, think of all the, the domains. Um, if you, your child has a goal of asking who's there, um, playing knock-knock games, having puppets, right? This like the puppets coming out from behind the um, cupboard. And so you're playing with your child, but you're also working on that who's their goal and you're prompting them. You have something behind your back and you say, hey, guess what I have? Guess who's here? To get your child to say, who's there? And it's, oh, it's your friend or it's, you know, whatever it is. So playing with those things. And if that's your goal, like your kids will love being surprised every time right, that you're asking who's there and, and you're, you're working on that. Um, so that's more of like a play-based one. Uh, but what if your goal is more? It's communication, right? They're asking for more. They're signing. They're learning the sign for more. Um, start with your snack time, you know, knowing that it's not necessarily um, in the moment super important that they're eating their whole meal. Like for sure, I, I don't recommend working on a lot of these things if it's like, we got to eat breakfast and we're in a, like we, we need to be eating, but hey, let's do snack time later. And you have as many Cheerios as you're asking for. And um, you have the Cheerios for them. You give them two or three, they're really excited. And then they, they want more naturally, hopefully if they're a little bit hungry and they're looking around and you can prompt more and you can give them two or three. And I mean, that could go on for 10 minutes that over time you've given them two or three Cheerios every time they ask you them a lot of praise. And um, this would be something, you know, how we're working on it with, um, with clients during therapy often or, um, Another one, like if you're working on prepositions, really being intentional about using that language while you're playing with your kids and narrating, oh, the dog's going in the house. Um, where do you see the dog? Can you put him on top of the house? And giving a lot of those directives instead of kind of just playing without them. There's so many great natural opportunities. Um, a great way to get your kids engaged is kind of to act like you don't know what you're doing, act a little lost and confused. And often if your kids are working on this in therapy, they're going to explore it with you and they're going to want to bring you in. Um, so, I mean, the best thing here is to know your child's goals and to ask the therapist, the providers, the school team, um, what, what they would recommend you, you work on. Um, okay. So that was a lot of info and I can see already the questions here. So I'll, um, I'll read them off if that works, Tiffany. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I just want to say there's so much information and I loved what you went through because I know for me as just a part of my journey, one of the things is actually anticipating and preparing, you know, when, when you know that, you know, if you go to the store and you think, okay, everything's going to go great and there's not going to be any tantrums. So it's, it's, it's having that thought of, okay, if I go to the store, here's what's happening. We're going to this family picnic. Here's the scenarios that could happen. How am I going to respond? How am I going to react? And really prepare for those times because you know there's going to need to be with us parents that have a neurodiverse child, there's going to have to be redirection. There's going to have to be positive reinforcement. And, and we have to, it really clicked with me when that happened is like, when I really mentally prepared myself and, and made sure that I was there to do that. So I love this stuff. Um, thank you for sharing. It, it was yes. great stuff. So yes, if you want to dive into the questions, go ahead. 
Sure. And I mean, that's a great piece too of, you know, wanting to give our kids the benefit of the doubt too, and call it out and say like, you know, with language that your kid's going to understand, but, but I know we're going to this picnic and I know you don't like when all the kids are running around and playing. And so just look at me or, or I can come to you and, and offer you your iPad if you want. Right. And like saying, calling it out of here's what's going to happen. Here's what I know you don't really love. Or, you know, I know you don't like going to the grocery store with me, but I forgot to get eggs to make the cake tonight. And we just have to go in and get the eggs. Right. And then holding to yourself to that word, like going in and getting one thing and leaving. Um, and, and really honoring the experiences that our kids go through. And when you know them, I mean, you're the expert on them saying like, yes. but I know you don't and like, that's where, like when we go swim with my son. And when he's done, he, he doesn't know when to stop, but he'll start, he'll start getting aggressive with other kids. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Oh, okay. It's, it's time to leave versus if you're tired, if you want to go in at any time or do this, you know, how do we get them to verbalize that versus showing aggression where it's like, okay, now you're just <laughs> totally well, and that's in line with one of the questions on here and I'll, I'll stop screen sharing so that makes my face bigger, but you know, one of the questions of, um, as a six-year-old who doesn't really verbally express his feelings. Um, sometimes she wonders if, if he's ignoring her or maybe he doesn't understand what's being said, you know, or the example Tiffany that you have at the pool, like saying with your kid, like, Hey, but I, you know, sometimes I can tell that by the end of swimming, when you're done, you show me that you're done by splashing other kids. Is that fair to say? Um, and, or you could say like, what's happening when you're splashing and maybe your kids can say it, but often we give more of the narrative or saying, um, you know, I can tell that sometimes you are sick of listening to me and, and then you don't look at me when I call your name. Is that fair to say? And give me your kids that language and like, oh yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Um, and so then coaching and in the example with the splashing saying like, so, you know, you get to decide, would you rather, if I see the splashing, I come up and tell you it's time to go. Cause it can be hard to leave your friends and they're all still playing. Or do you want to let me know? Maybe your kid still says, I want to let you know, but then you see the splashing and you can go over with the reminder. Remember what we talked about earlier? Should we get out of the pool now? And again, giving them as much agency and ownership as we can, but catching it before it gets super escalated. And, and maybe all he wants is that out. He doesn't want to be the kid who says, I want to go home. Right? Like I, you know, my sister hated sleepovers and was always getting these stomach aches at sleepovers. And so my mom eventually was like, Grace, if you don't want to stay at this party, like I can call and act like I need to pick you up. Like, yes, please do that. <laughs> right? Like, I don't want to be the kid who goes home, but it's easier if you don't let me stay. Um, and so kind of thinking of some of those things, but yeah, the, the question too, of like expressing our feelings, I think a lot of it is labeling and saying, you know, I can, it seems like maybe you're really tired after a day at camp. Um, Is it better for you if when we get home, you take a break on the iPad for 20 minutes before I ask you to do your chores? You were like, wait, yeah, that's all I want. (laughs) Awesome. Okay. Um, And so really calling that out is is super helpful, but yeah, it can be really hard to identify the function of of the behavior and it could change. You know, we didn't talk about this much, but (laughs) sometimes it's this, the same behavior can serve multiple functions. So it's really looking at that before, like what's happening before can really help guide maybe the why in this moment. Um, I see another question. Um, kind of going back to that, that interrupting, you know, it sounds like this, you're mentioning that your child um, also has ADHD. Am I correct on that? Um, ASD, ADHD, ODD. Um, and doesn't seem to apply the skills to, sorry, but yeah, it's the same question. Um, okay. What do you do when your child has ASD, ADHD, ODD, but does not apply the skills to calm down, to deal with his frustrations and continues to get physically aggressive. Then he apologizes and states that he can't help himself. Oh gosh, that's hard. Um, you know, a lot of the, the work, I feel like the field of ABA is moving to is identifying um, what we would call signals. So what are the signals that your child's giving that things are not going right before it gets to physical aggression? Um, you know, maybe it's a child who looks down and doesn't, doesn't make eye contact when they're talking to you. And that kind of starts the process, or maybe they're giving you one word answers or no answers or the door slams, right? There's some of, often kids have some some signals are trying to tell us, I don't like this happening uh, before they get to that physical aggression. And often that's when we're most successful at coping strategies or at being able to say, um, 
here's a strategy you can use, right? If there are no signals though, and it, and it seems to go from everything super great and fun to a flip switches, switch flips, switch flips, and suddenly it seems like chaos, um, really trying to work with, you know, maybe a, maybe a professional or kind of doing a lot of work on those, that antecedent behavior consequence piece. Um, when, when we take that data, we look at also time of day, you know, often, um, I've had kids where it's predictably before lunchtime. And then we learn, gosh, they didn't have breakfast. And this kid's been at school all day and is on an empty stomach. And yeah, one thing just sent him over the edge. Um, or I've had kids, you know, we'll talk with doctors too, or the dentist, gosh, molars. <laughs> like it seems like it's coming out of nowhere. And then we find out from the dentist, like, yeah, he's actually growing in his 12 year old molars a year early. And oh gosh, well, maybe your teeth hurt out of nowhere, like kind of ruling all these things out too. So there's so much that goes into it, but if there are no signals and you're, everything's fine, your kid's playing the game and then suddenly flips, you know, they're winning and they're playing with their best friend and suddenly flips the board over and storms away. Um, sometimes we look at like, how long can there be peace before this happens? And maybe then as the adult in their life, it, I know, yeah, you can play a game for about 25 minutes and then it all goes goes off the rails. I might jump in at 20 and, and just say, we're taking a break <laughs> and like, no one's engaging in any signals right now, but I might just like, I know my kid doesn't do well for more than 25 minutes and I want this to continue going. So we're going to pause the game and everyone's going to go take a stretch break and we'll come back and, um, kind of proactively using some of those strategies too, but gosh, it can be hard when there's, it seems to come out of nowhere. There's another question that popped in. What if a child of 13 year old, year old gets into physical aggression and verbal as well? And he wants to do that, what he wants to say and you say, no, what do you do? Oh gosh. Yeah. That saying no can be one of the biggest triggers <laughs> that, that is in our, our, uh, our world as a, as a caregiver or parent. Um, and we, we talk about this a lot, but offering a lot of, um, those proactive things we would call them. And so being able to say like, um, uh, set up your environment for success. And so maybe it's, you know, you're going to have to say no, or I definitely have kids who self-sabotage and they'll ask for things that they cannot have. Um, and I then go in of, um, you know, the iPad's not available right now. Or like I've had kids, you get the computer taken away and they're going to ask for the computer all week long. Um, often so that you say no, and then they can escalate. Cause then maybe if they escalate enough, you're going to give in. And so going in with the, but you know, you can't have your computer right now, but you can watch TV or play on your switch, right? Here are the other things that you can have or do or, or the when, right? Like computer's not available right now. Like you do have to make your bed, but you can have it right when you're done and setting it up and knowing to like, I'm about to say no to you. So I'm going to, I'm going to explain it, especially if a 13 year old, like I think all kids are, but teenagers are deserving of that. Why? And they might not agree with it, but the more, um, the more we can go, you know, like maybe he wants to stay out all night and you say no. And then he tries to escape. Like, gosh, I can't, I don't know enough about it to give you a full answer, but maybe you are saying, um, you're telling him when he can stay out with friends or when he can plan for that and, and the safety reasons and the why, and then, you know, working with someone, um, maybe to offer more specific strategies. Um, well, I know we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, you know, behavior is, there's so many complications and totally. so many different variables that arise and, you know, thank you so much. I think that, you know, one of the questions was the ABA services. Do you, can you put in, um, uh, well, on your presentation, does it have how to contact you and all of that information? It um, does. Okay. Um, and I can quickly just show folks um, our website too. And I can put that in the um in the chat, but, um, here's our website. So kyocare.com. Um, you can make an enroll appointment right here. So this will take you, if you're interested and maybe you just want to learn more, uh, but you can click this button and it'll, you can set up a time that works for you. Uh, pick a 15 minute time. Um, we offer them in English and Spanish. You can also just give us a call. Um, and that all is in the, in the presentation as well. So you'll get links to that. Then you'll also be able to see where we serve. Um, as I said, we're all around the U.S. right now, which is so exciting, but there's certainly ABA providers 
um, across the country, across, um, across the world too. So, uh, connecting and even just having that conversation to see, you know, I, I do an intake call with every family that's interested and talk through and really get to know their child. And sometimes we get through it and it's like, gosh, yeah, this model isn't really what you're looking for, but we can do, you know, here's another resource I can send you. Typically I send folks back to guiding bright minds anyway, <laughs> but, um, you know, we take that call and, and we certainly want to make sure that, that this is the right fit for your family. Um, uh, but you can always just call and we can talk through what that looks like. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Maggie, so much. This was such a great and a conversation that any parent of a near to first child can have constantly on a daily basis. Um, so I appreciate you being here, taking the time. Thank you all for joining today. I hope it was helpful. Um, lots of great conversations, tools, and resources. As I said, I'll send out the recording and a copy of the presentation. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me, Tiffany. Bye. Bye.